Okay. Uh, so this is the review session for EGME 333, uh, fall 2020 semester for the second midterm. Uh, okay. Uh, so I looked up the uh, the poll online. Let me turn on my mic. Uh, so I looked at the poll online, um, and it looks like the uh, the winners um, for the topics that you guys want to see. Number one is angular momentum. Um, so that had the most votes. But then very close behind that was potential flow. Um, there was only one vote behind. Uh, and then in third place, kind of a distant third, was control volumes and linear momentum. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to be covering these ones today. Um, and so what my plan is is to do, you know, for at least for the first two, to kind of just do a brief, a brief recap of the theory and the equations that you need for them, uh, and then do maybe just a quick example. So like for um, angular momentum, you know, I'm, I was planning to do the, the homework problem that uh, you guys are probably working on right now. Okay. Uh, and then for potential flow, um, I have the extra problem that I, um, that I posted onto Canvas. Okay. Uh, so we'll work that one out. And then if we have time at the end, um, you know, we'll go over linear momentum as well. Okay. Okay. And so the first topic that we're going to go over is control volumes for angular momentum. So these follow the same, um, you know, the same um, um, methods that we've been doing for all of our control volume problems. And the first step here is to do Reynolds transfer. Okay. 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 And so, you know, for all the control volume problems, so we, we did basically four different ones um, in, in our class. So we did mass, uh, we did linear momentum, we did angular momentum, and we did energy, okay? And so the, the, the RTT, just to kind of remind you, looks like this, okay? Right. And so we have the total derivative of um, some quantity B with respect to time, okay? And so remember what this term is right here, this represents generation. And so the generation term, remember, is always going to be very special for every, um, you know, instance of, uh, of control volume analysis, because the generation basically represents how our quantity can be generated within our fluid. So this is the one where, you know, you can't just really just plug in and, and solve. You kind of have to really kind of understand what the quantity is that you're looking at, um, and then think about how that can be generated from within a fluid. So, you know, there's, there's nothing really to plug in on, on this left-hand side, but it's more just how do you understand the physical quantities that we're, that we're looking at, okay? And I'll kind of review each, each one that we did um, and how this applies specifically to angle momentum. Okay. All right, next we have our accumulation term. So our accumulation term, remember, was a partial derivative with respect to t of the integral of rho little b dv and so remember, little b right here is our property, but it, it's in its intensive form. So it's big B divided by mass. Okay. All right, and then finally, we have our inlet outlet term. Okay. okay. And that's uh, given by that guy right there. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and label these. And so on the right-hand side, this equal sign, you know, this is where we're going to plug in for the quantities, okay? And so for each application of RTT, remember what we plug in for here is little b, right? Where little b right here is our intensive property. Right? Uh, and so the intensive property is going to change depending on what conservation law that we're looking at, right? Um, and so, you know, when we apply this Reynolds transport to the different conservation laws, we have to ask ourselves kind of two things. Uh, one, what is our little b for this uh, conservation law? So what do we plug in for, you know, this green quantity here? And then two, what do we plug in for generation? Okay. And so for the case of angular momentum, for angular momentum, our little b is going to be uh, the cross product um, between um, a, a radius vector and the velocity vector. So I think this is why, uh, this is where, you know, angular momentum can seem a little bit intimidating to people because, 
you know, you have this cross product term inside the integral and, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, too, too many math operations to can't to handle at any given time. Um, but if we use kind of our, our trusty kind of right hand rule, um, then this actually becomes, you know, um, you know, relatively simple to pick out. Okay. And so that's our, our little B. So our, our little B is that. And so if our little B is R cross U, then our big B, which we don't actually use in this problem, but you know, just for the sake of completeness, is gonna be mass times little b. So it's gonna be m times b, which is mass times r cross e. Okay. Okay. And so at this point, we have to ask ourselves, how is angular momentum generated within a fluid? Um, or you know, how is angular momentum generated for just any kind of object? And so for the generation of angular momentum, you know, we kind of borrow from our Newton second law um, that we saw before, right? Uh, and so um, from before, what we saw was that the, uh, um, you know, the way that we can generate uh, linear momentum on an object is that we just apply an external force. And so kind of the angular equivalent of an external force is an external moment or an external torque. And so the symbol that we usually give for that is just the sum of all big M like that, okay? Um, okay, um, and so on the next page, I'm gonna put this all together to give us our conservation of angular momentum expression, okay? Okay, and so our, our final expression looks like the following. So we have our generation term, okay? So we have sum of all the moments, um, and I've added the subscript EXT to denote uh, external. Then we have partial partial t of rho r cross u dv, okay? So remember that's our accumulation term. Then we have our, um, our inflow outflow term, okay? okay? And so here, right, this is our um, RTT expression for conservation of angular momentum. Okay. And so any problems that require, um, you know, any kind of torque or anything like that, or any kind of rotation, this is the, uh, um, the equation that you're going to use. Okay. Uh, and so, um, you know, first of all, let's, uh, let's simplify this a little bit. And so we, we know that, you know, for most of the problems that we're considering, um, or, you know, basically all of them at this point, we assume that our simi our, that our, um, our case is going to be steady. Okay. And so we know for a steady simulation or a steady uh, case, um, sorry, I'm, just got done talking with my research students, um, then, you know, our any term that has a time derivative here is going to be zero, okay? okay. And so that kind of right off the bat kind of simplifies your, your calculations quite a bit because then we don't have to worry about any kind of accumulation, okay? And so what this basically tells us is that the, um, the sum of the external moments that are placed on a control volume, they're going to be equal to the contributions to the angular momentum from all the inlets and the outlets of our, our model. Okay. All right. And so I, I got one good question in office hours, I think a few weeks ago. Uh, and that's, you know, when do we know, or how do we know when, when we need to apply this, um, this equation? Okay. Uh, and so, you know, we, we apply this equation for cases um, which um, usually you'll know because, uh, first of all, there'll, there'll be some kind of hinge or some kind of rotation um, in the problem geometry, okay? And so if you're doing a problem and you notice that there's a, a hinge in there, um, that's usually a good, uh, a good indication that, you know, at some point we're probably gonna have to pull in uh, conservation of angular momentum, okay? And so another really big hint is that if you come across a problem and it asks you to solve for a moment or a torque,
And so this is, this is usually the biggest hint right here because, um, you know, all the other equations that we've gone over for, um, you know, for Reynolds transport and even for like potential flow in Navier Stokes, the only um, um, problem type that has torque in it is going to be the, uh, this conservation of angular momentum. Okay. And so any problem that involves torque and it's a control volume problem, you know that you have to apply this equation right here. Okay. Uh, and so I know, you know, we, we covered torque. We, we, we touched on torque a little bit in fluid statics, but remember fluid statics is not going to be part of this midterm. So, you know, anytime you see a torque, you know, probably it's going to be some control volume problem that involves angular momentum. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so that kind of, you know, gives you some hints on when you should use this. And so I think, you know, the, probably the biggest thing on everyone's mind is, you know, how do we evaluate this guy? Okay. Okay. And so remember, you know, what I want you guys to remember for this term is that you always have to use the right hand rule to evaluate it. Okay. And I'll kind of illustrate that in the next uh, example problem where I'm going to work through the, the homework problem, problem two, um, in particular problem two D. Okay. Okay. So this is an example, okay? And so this, in this problem, we basically have a, an L bend for a pipe, okay? So the problem geometry looks something like this. We have a hinge at the top right here, okay? Right? And so there's our hint, right? So we have a hinge, so we know that, you know, there's probably gonna be some rotation about the hinge, right? And so we have an inlet flow coming in like this, And so we have a U in. We also have a uh, diameter for the inlet, okay? And then from the outlets, we have um, this, okay? So we have U out out here, and then we have D out, okay? We also know the distance in between um, the hinge and the inlet jet, so this is gonna be R in right here, okay? And we also know the distance from the outlet jet to the hinge as well, and so this is going to be R out. Okay. Okay. And so let's put some numbers on this. So the problem tells us that U in is equal to three meters per second. D in is equal to five centimeters. D out is equal to eight centimeters. R in is equal to 2.5 centimeters. Um, R out is equal to 15 centimeters. And then our density is gonna be 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed, okay? And so in part D of this problem, what I tell you is that this, this um, arrangement or this, uh, um, you know, this configuration is not rotating, so it's completely still, okay? And so part D basically asks you, you know, in order to prevent this from rotating, there has to be some kind of torque that's applied on the hinge. Uh, and so we want to solve for that torque uh, in order for us to, uh, uh, to solve for this problem, okay? Uh, and so that, that right there, that right there is our second hint. So the fact that we have to solve for a torque means that, you know, we have to apply um, angular momentum. Here, okay? okay, so first of all, you know, before we do that, um, let's actually do part B of this problem because part B has a solve for U out, okay? Because uh, we're going to need that in the next part, okay? All right, so part B basically asks you to solve for the flow rate, and it also asks you to solve for the outlet velocity. And so, you know, when you're doing a control volume problem, conservation of mass should almost always be your first step. Because um, what conservation of mass will allow you to do most of the time is that, it, one, it'll either let you compute the low rates or it'll let you compute the mass flow rates um, in the problem, uh, which is, you know, a very, very important quantity. Uh, and number two, it, it should let you compute for the uh, outlet inlet and outlet velocities, okay? And so for everything beyond, you know, um, beyond conservation of mass, whether it's linear momentum, angular momentum or energy, 
in order to actually apply those RTT formulas, you need to know the velocities at the outlets. Um, and the way that you usually obtain that 95% of the time is to apply conservation of mass. Okay. Okay, and so in this problem, we have the velocity at the inlet, and so the inlet velocity is three meters per second, uh, and we also have the diameter at the inlet, which is five centimeters, okay? And so basically what we can do um, is we can use these and solve for the flow rate. So the flow rate is simply just gonna be the product of the inlet velocity and the inlet area, okay? Uh, and so inlet area, we're given diameter here, so it's gonna be u in uh, pi over four uh, d, squ uh, d in squared, And so you plug all that in and you get 0 0.0059 meters cubed per second. Okay. All right. And so from this flow rate, we can also compute the velocities at the outlet. So because of conservation of mass, um, you know, the flow rates have to be the same. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Right. And so by conservation of mass, And so, you know, when you see me doing these problems, I, I know that most of the time we just cancel out this, the unsteady term or the accumulation term, but you, it's, it's always good practice just to write out the full equations anyway. Um, you know, that doesn't just apply this, that's, that's also applies to Navier-Stokes too, because sometimes you never know. You never know what terms are, are actually gonna cancel out uh, or what terms actually stay in because, you know, it, it's, it's different for every single problem. And so don't just skip to kind of a, a later for, a format of an equation because you might miss a detail that was important um, you know, for this problem, okay? Okay, so for conservation of mass in this problem, we have um, partial partial T of rho dV, okay, plus integral of rho u dot n dA, okay? Right? And since we have a steady case, we can go ahead and cancel that guy out. Okay. And then let's write out this, uh, this integral right here for the inlet and the outlet, okay? As so we have zero is equal to um, rho times minus u in, okay? A in, okay? Right, and so remember, you know, this, uh, this dot product of u dot n you know, we use the, the sign convention for the carrying velocity, right? And so if it's an inlet, we make it negative, and if it's an outlet, we make it positive, okay? And so that's the, uh, um, that's the inlet term. And now let's write the outlet term. So the outlet term, we have rho. We have a positive u out, because u out, because um, we have an outflow here, so that's gonna be positive. And we multiply by a out, okay? And so right away, what we can see is that we have a density in both of these terms, okay? And so let's divide through by density. And then what we get from this expression is that um, zero is equal to minus u in a in plus u out a out, okay? But we know from, part, uh, from earlier in this problem that this product of u in times a in, this is uh, already q in, so we already know what this is, okay? And so if we solve for u out, we find that u out is equal to Q in divided by A out, okay? 
And so if we plug in an expression for A out, because we know the diameter, so we have four times Q in, divided by pi D out squared. And then what we get from this is 1.17 meters per second. And so you always want to make sure that you start with conservation of mass because that, that will usually give you something, you know, that's missing in the problem. So more times than not, there's going to be at least one velocity that's, that's going to be missing in the problem. Uh, and before you do anything else, before you do linear momentum, before you do angular momentum or energy, you know, you need to know the velocities at all the, at all the inlets and outlets of the model. And so remember, always apply conservation. Even if the problem doesn't explicitly say you know, apply conservation of mass to solve for the velocities. Just, it should be something that's kind of instinctual to you so that, you know, you just, you look at a problem and you say, you know, I don't, I know the velocity here, but I don't know the velocity here. And the way that you get that is, is through conservation of mass. Okay. okay. And thankfully conservation of mass is, is the simplest one to apply just because, you know, we have zero generation um, and, you know, there's, there's less stuff that we need to worry about. Okay. Okay. And so now that we know the velocity at the outlet, we're ready to do part D, which is to find the torque, okay? Uh, and for the torque, remember, we're gonna apply our conservation of angular momentum, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. Wrong symbol. Okay. And so our conservation of angular momentum looks like this. We have the sum of all the external moments is equal to partial partial T, of integral of rho r cross u dv plus integral of r cross u uh, rho u dot m, okay, dA, right? And so just like uh, we saw before, this term cancels out because it's a steady problem. And then we're left with the external force, or the external moment, sorry. Okay. Uh, in this case, there's only gonna be one because it just only comes from the, the hinge. So I'm just gonna leave it as a single one, okay? And this is gonna be equal to this um, inflow outflow term um, evaluated at the inlet and the outlet, okay? And so I'm gonna do basically both two of these guys, one of which I'm gonna evaluate at the inlet and the other one I'm gonna evaluate at the outlet, okay? Okay. All right, and so uh, let's do the inlet first, okay? And so, you know, uh, you know, if, if you kind of remember from, from your math classes, you know that the, the, the result of a cross product like this, of R cross U, is going to be a vector, right? <clears throat> Um, but, you know, for our, for our intensive purposes, you know, in which we're looking at mostly two-dimensional problems, that vector is always just going to be out of the page. So we're going to treat this like a scalar, okay? Okay. And remember, the reason for that is because we're only considering 2D problems, okay? And so the scalar um, version of this is simply just going to be the product of R, and so R is going to be the distance in between your inlet jet and the, and the rotation hinge. Okay. Okay. And so for the inlet, that's going to be R in. Okay. And so this is distance. It's going to be R in times U in, okay? All right, and so that's our, uh, um, that's our evaluation of that cross product term right there, okay? Then we're going to multiply by our density, okay? Then after density, we have our carrying velocity, okay? And so our carrying velocity was this guy here that we just pulled down. And since, remember, this is an inlet, we're going to use a minus u in, okay? And then we have a in right here, okay? Okay. And so that's, uh, so that's all the terms that you need to include. 
And so the only question at this point is what do we choose uh, for the sign in front of this R N U N, right? And so remember the sign that we choose for this is our right hand rule. And so for the right-hand rule, uh, remember, remember what we did, what we did before. So we formed our hand kind of like, like a finger guns. We have our pointer finger pointing outwards. We have our thumb pointing up. And then the rest of our three fingers are pointing this way. Okay? So I do the three fingers just kind of to avoid clicking people off. Okay. And so what you do is that you, you go to your paper. Um, in this case, your paper is going to look like this, right? Uh, so hopefully this works out. And what you're going to do is you're going to take um, the R vector, and so remember, the R vector always points from the hinge um, to, um, uh, to, your, to your velocity stream, okay? Okay. And so in this case, you know our hinge is at the top, and so our velocity streams at the bottom. And so we're going to uh, point our, our pointer finger down that way, right? Um, so from the hinge to the velocity stream. And then the next part is we're going to take our three fingers and then point that into the direction of the flow, OK? So do you see? <laughs> it's, it's really hard. But basically, you know, you, 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 the, the, the L that you form in between your, your pointer finger and, your, and your, three, um, your three other fingers that should be your R vector for your pointer finger and then your velocity vector for your three other fingers, okay? And then if you do that, you should see that your thumb, your thumb should either be pointing out of the page or into the page, okay? All right, and so what the right-hand rule basically says that is if your thumb is pointing out of the page, And so if your thumb points out of the page, then this is a positive number, okay? okay? But if your thumb points into the page, okay, then we make this term negative, okay? And so in this particular problem, we had a thumb pointing out of the page because, you know, um, we pointed um, R and then U and then our thumb is pointing out, okay? Try not to sprain your thumb when you're doing this. You know, rotate, rotate your papers if you have to. Okay, and so because of that, we're going to put a positive sign on this R in U in. Okay. Okay, so that's the inlet term, and so now let's do the outlet term. Okay? And so for the outlet, we're going to have the same collection of terms, um, but then after we're going to do the, um, you know, the uh, the right hand rule for the outlet stream. Okay, and so we're going to have R out. U out, okay, times rho, which is our density, okay, times U out, okay, and so our carrying velocity here is positive because remember we're at an outlet, okay, and then we have A out, okay, and so those are the terms that we're going to use for for this, uh, and so now let's determine the sign for for this guy, okay, and so you can see we have U um, the outlet stream at the bottom there. And so first thing we're going to do, we're going to point our um, index finger in the direction of R out. And so the direction for out, R out is going to be like this, okay? And then our three other fingers, we're going to point in the direction of the velocity. So since the velocity is going down like this, okay? And you can see because that I'm, I'm almost kind of stabbing my face right here, that your thumb is pointing into the page, okay? And so since my thumb is pointing into the page for this, um, for this case, I'm going to stick a negative out in the front right there, OK? OK. And so now that we've determined the signs of all these things, now it's just you know simplifying and plugging in the numbers, OK? And so if we simplify a little bit, we get that m external is equal to, um, I'm going to pull a negative out in front. So you have negative rho times um, r in u in squared times a in plus r out u out squared a out okay 
and then we can just simply plug in the numbers and then what we get is minus 1.474 newtons meters. And so the last part of that problem asks you to determine whether this is going to be a clockwise moment or a counterclockwise. Okay? Uh, and so the sign convention that's typically used is that any um, counterclockwise moment is going to be positive and any clockwise moment is going to be negative. Uh, and so since we got a negative moment out of this, this is clockwise. Okay? All right. And so I know with the uh, with the conservation of angular momentum, you know, we have another um, sign convention um, that we have to keep in mind. But you know, this one is just the right hand rule. So remember, for these kinds of problems, the the sign convention is 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 always going to be the most challenging thing. Um, but once you get the sign convention down, then it's all it's all a matter of just you know setting up the RTT expression, plugging in for the right values, um, and then just and then just evaluating it just like that. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the advice I, I gave to somebody in office hours the other day is that, you know, definitely look at the example prop, the other uh, assigned problems, or not assigned, the extra problems that are given in each homework assignment. And so all of those are, are really good problems. Uh, and so I don't have the, uh, um, I don't have the solutions for those, um, just because I, I haven't worked them all out. But, you know, uh, what I told that person is that, you know, don't, you don't have to work out all the problems uh, in full detail, because that, that kind of takes a long time. Um, and you want to be efficient with your time when you're studying. But instead, you know, what you can do is that you can look at a problem, you know, draw out the figure for it, and then just kind of make a game plan for how you would solve this. So, you know, talk about, you know, what equations that you would apply, what sign conventions would you would apply, and, you know, how would you, how would you go about computing the thing that you, uh, that you need to solve for, okay? Um, okay. And so that's the review for, um, um, that's the review for conservation of angular momentum. Um, and so you remember the, the most the most key thing here is just you know applying the right hand rule. And so the next thing that we're going to go over is potential flow. Okay. And so potential flow was was quite a big topic actually. So you know we spent you know quite a long time doing uh, potential flow. Um, and you know the reason we kind of spent a long time with it is because it, it was quite a it was quite a bit different from everything that we had gone over you know for the past few weeks on control volume analysis. Okay? And so the main difference um, you know with potential flow um, that I want you guys to remember is that the output for potential flow is a spatial distribution of velocity and sometimes pressure. And so the key here is, is spatial distributions, okay? And so kind of what you saw in the previous problem is that, you know, when we do control volume analysis, control volumes are really great at finding quantities at specific kind of discrete locations, so, um, or kind of overall quantities. So, um, you know, like we just saw in the previous problem, what's the torque on this entire control volume? Or, you know, what's the velocity at this output right here? So if you're looking for kind of discrete quantities or like overall quantities for a, uh, um, for a control volume, um, you know, uh, control volumes are, are, are usually good for that. But what potential flow and, and subsequently Navier-Stokes is good for is giving us, you know, detailed spatial distributions on the velocity, okay? And so what this will allow us to do is that this basically allows us to sketch and describe, um, you know, the flow patterns or the, or the stream ones, okay? And a lot of times, you know, this uh, being able to sketch the flow pattern is something that's really, you know, useful, right? Because if you think of like an application like, um, you know, like aerospace, 
So I, I tried to draw an airfoil, but it ended up looking like a sperm. Okay, there we go, airfoil. Okay, and so a lot of times, like if you're doing uh, aerospace analysis, um, you know, you're interested in seeing, you know, how does the wind go over this airfoil, okay? Right, and so if you did this problem with like control volume analysis, you might be able to find out, you know, what's the flow rate here, or what's the force that's applied here, or something like that, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of times we're interested in seeing, give me a detailed description of, you know, how the velocity looks as it goes over an airfoil or as it goes over a sports car or, you know, as it, as it goes over like a bird or something like that, okay? Um, in order to do that, you need, um, you know, uh, either potential flow or navier stoke because that's, that's just not possible with, with control lines, okay? Uh, and so, you know, as we kind of go through potential flow, I, I, I think it's really easy to get lost um, in kind of the mathematics, because sometimes, you know, the algebra and, and the computations get really intense. But I want you guys to always remember, you know, to kind of place these methods in context for, you know, what are they used for? What is their, their point, right? Um, because it's, you know, at a certain point, you know, it's, it's you, you, you can get really good at, at doing these certain kinds of problems. Like, you know, if I give you a problem with a stream function, like, you know, you practice enough and you can kind of, you know, take the derivatives, get the speed, get the pressure, you know, and that's fine. Um, but I think what's going to be more important and ultimately, I think, more useful for your careers is to kind of put out, put these things in context for saying, you know, I learned this in fluid mechanics because, because of this, right? Um, and so I think a lot of people get to the point where they can say, I learned this. Um, but, you know, people ask, why did you learn that? And then, you know, it's, it's not a, that's not as easy to answer. So, you know, um, differentiating between potential flow and navier stokes and, you know, control volume analysis you know, that's, that's, that's a really big distinction and, and one big takeaway that I want you guys to get from this, okay? Okay, all right, so then how do we actually do uh, potential flow analysis? So potential flow analysis, the starting point is um, almost always gonna be a stream function, okay? And so remember, our stream function is given by a symbol psi, okay? And so the way that you pronounce this is like psi, okay? So if you played Pokemon back in the day, it's like psi duck, but it's not spelled like that. So it's PSI, okay? And what psi basically is, is, is remember, psi is a scalar function, okay? And that's key, okay? And so scale, we, we really like scalar functions a lot in, uh, in engineering because scalar functions are, are relatively easy to evaluate and solve for, okay? Um, and the way, the way that we use these stream functions is that we take derivatives to get um, velocity components. And so if you have a stream function um, and either it's given to you in Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates, um, you know, the way that you, you get the velocity components out of that is you simply just take the derivatives, okay? Um, okay. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the other nice feature for stream functions is that they, uh, um, if you take stream functions for different kind of flow phenomenon, you can simply just add them together um, in order to get kind of a bigger stream function, okay? Uh, or in other words, the way we can say that is to get complex flow, we can uh, add the stream functions together, okay? And so the result of adding stream functions together is that you kind of get one big stream function that kind of describes your complex flow. And then once you have that one big stream function, then you take the derivatives of it and then you can, um, you know, and then away you go, okay? And so, you know, you don't have to know that this is kind of the reason you can do this, but just, you know, just for some trivia, the reason that you can add these, um, you can add stream functions together is because these stream functions satisfy what's known as Laplace's equation, okay? So you don't need to know that for the exam or for anything, but you know, if you're interested in pursuing fluids, 
um, you know, beyond this class, and you know, that's um, that's kind of a nice little tidbit to know. Um, and so, um, you know, the, what we went over in class was we, we also, in addition to stream functions, we also found the stream functions for what I call the basic flows, okay? Or the, uh, the fundamental flows, okay? Or building block flows, I think that's the, that's the term that I call it. Okay. And so I'm just going to summarize them really quick here. So. You know, I'm not going to write out their equations because, you know, for the string functions, because you can find that in the notes. But what I think is kind of more important for this is to um, just look at, you know, how these flows actually look like. Okay. Now, so the first one we looked at was uniform flow. Okay. And so uniform flow is simply just, you know, flow that all goes in one direction. Okay. And so basically the characteristic for uniform flow is that all the streamlines or all the arrows are going to be parallel. And so the next um, flow that we went over was the source and the sink, okay? All right. And so the source and the sink had flow that was kind of radiating out from it, okay? And so the source and the sink had a point in the center. And so what I'm drawing here is a source, so everything is kind of coming out from the, from the origin, and a sink would be the opposite, so that all the flow would be going in, okay? And remember, for the source and the sink and the vortex and the doublet, you know, we have a singularity at the center. Okay. All right, so that's source and sink. And so that's visually what it looks like. And so the next one that we went over was a vortex. Okay. And so a vortex um, represents just any kind of uh, spinning flow. Okay. And so we have a, a center like this. You know, and we have flow that's kind of spinning around that, right? Okay. And so that's a vortex, or so that vortex represents any kind of spinning. And then finally, we have the doublet. So the doublet's really interesting, um, just because the doublet itself doesn't really have that much physical meaning. It actually looks kind of weird. Uh, and so, the, you know, the streamlines kind of looks like this. Right? So it kind of looks like two circles that are kind of coming in like that, okay? And so the doublet by itself is, is actually not used for, for all that much. Um, but what it's actually used for is to, um, you know, is to combine with the uniform flow in order to get a cylinder, okay? And that's and that's one of the examples that we did in class. And so a doublet, you know, you'll you'll very rarely see it uh, unless it's you know something that I want to add to a cylindrical flow. Um, but you know, just know that the doublet just by itself is is never used all that much. Okay. Okay. And so uh, you know, before we jump into example, um, you know, I, I do want to go over kind of the uh, um, kind of the two. Um, principles or the two theorems that we went over for a potential flow. Okay. And so the first of this was D'Alembert's paradox. Okay. And so remember what D'Alembert's paradox basically states is that, you know, if you have an object um, sitting in a flow field, Uh, an object sitting in a uniform in a uniform flow field, then that object is going to experience no drag. Okay. okay. 
And so this is the reason why it's called a paradox is because it's, uh, it, it makes no sense or it makes no intuitive sense, right? And so what that basically says is that, you know, if you have an object, so we, we, the, the example we did in class was for a cylinder, but actually you can, you can show D'Alembert's paradox for any kind of object. So let's say that you have a person, okay? Is a happy person with two eyes, Mont stylus, two eyes with a unibrow, okay. Um, and so, you know, what D'Alembert's paradox is that you can stand outside in a hurricane, so a hurricane could have like hurricane force winds coming at you, right? Um, but then what's going to happen in Down Bear's paradox is that, you know, the hurricane's going to do nothing to you, okay? And you know the reason the reason you know you can do that is because you experience no drag, right? So if you do, if you actually do stand out in a hurricane, um, which you know don't don't actually do it just to test this out, you know you're going to get blown away by the hurricane, right? And so the reason you get blown away in the direction of the wind is because you experience a drag. Force. So a drag force is nothing more than just a force that you experience in the same direction of the flow as a result of a flow kind of hitting you. Okay. And so the interesting thing is that potential flow or all the theory that we've been going over with these string functions, it doesn't predict this, this drag force at all, okay? And so that's why it's a paradox. And so the reason for that is, um, remember the big, the big assumption that we're making in potential flow is that, you know, we have no viscosity, right? And so without any viscosity, then there's no way for there to be any drag force, okay? And so that's D'Alembert's paradox. So, um, you know, in order to experience any kind of drag, either um, you know, once we, uh, once we get, we'll, we'll come back to this later in the class, either skin friction drag um, or form drag, you know, you need to have some viscosity in the flow. Without viscosity, then there's no drag. Okay. okay. So that's D'Alembert's paradox. And so the other um, um, concept that we went over was the Magnus effect. Okay. okay. And so the Magnus effect, what this basically states is that if you um, add any rotation to the uh, um, to a flow, okay, okay. Um, adding a rotation to an object in flow was is going to add an additional force. And so as an example, let's take like a, like a baseball that's kind of flying through the air, okay? And so for the baseball, we have the streamlines that look like this, okay? And so this, in this case, you know, if the flow is going from left to right, then the baseball is traveling from right to left, okay? okay. And so these are the, the streamlines of the air that's kind of flowing around the baseball, okay? And so you know, normally the baseball is just traveling like this, but if you add spin to the baseball, and so let's, let's spin it, you know, uh, counterclockwise in this way, okay? And so the spin is, is going to alter the streamlines above and below it, okay? And so if we look at the areas um, above the streamline, okay, or above the ball, okay, the rotation is going to add a velocity that kind of curve, that kind of goes to the left, okay? And so this is kind of opposing the flow that's going on top of the streamline, which wants to go left to right, okay? And so the net effect of adding spin here is that the is that the fluid on top of the baseball goes slower. Okay. Okay. And then by contrast, if we look at what's happening on the bottom of the baseball, right? On the bottom of the baseball, because we're rotating counterclockwise, then the spin is going to add um, it's going to add um, velocity to the flow in the bottom. Okay, because they're both going in the same direction. And so if they're both going in the same direction, they're going to augment. And so what's going to happen is that we have faster flow down here. Okay. All right. And so at this point, you know, we have we have an asymmetry in the problems. We have a slower flow on top and a faster flow on bottom. Okay. And if we apply Bernoulli, you know, we can uh, we can say something about the pressures, right? And so for uh, for a slower flow, we know that uh, a slower flow is going to produce high pressures, okay, or higher pressures.
Meanwhile, a faster flow um, is going to produce lower pressures. Okay. And so the net effect of this is that if, if you have a higher pressure on top and a lower pressure on the bottom, there's going to be a net force that goes in that direction. Okay. And this force, we say that it goes, because since it, you know, it goes from up to down and the flow and the general flow field is going from left to right, we say that this force is perpendicular to the flow. Okay. Right. And so any force that's perpendicular to the flow, we characterize this as a lift force. Okay. And so if you look, you know, at the uh, kind of the textbook definitions of, of Magnus effect, what it'll basically tell you is you add spin um, to any kind of flow field, then the spin is going to produce lift. Okay. Uh, and so that's, this is kind of the, the reasoning behind it, uh, because, you know, adding a vortex to the flow, you know, will, uh, will change, will add some asymmetry to the problem. Okay. And so in the notes, you know, I, I basically kind of go through the math of, of how to do this, but, you know, this is kind of just the general um, consequence for it. Okay. Okay. And so that's the, uh, all the theory that goes into potential flow. And so now let's do kind of a, an example. Okay. Okay. Okay, and so let's um, let's do the example from the um, from the extra notes. Okay, and so in the extra notes, let's say that we have a stream function that's given by x squared plus two y squared. Okay, and so what we want to do from this um, is that we want to um, compute the velocity components. Um, we also want to compute the, uh, the distribution of speed. Okay. Okay. And then from speed, we're we can also compute the pressure distribution. Okay. Okay, and so first let's uh, let's find the velocity components. Okay, right, and so to find the velocity components, all we're going to do is, is we're simply going to take derivatives of our stream function. Okay, so we're going to do um, for the u, we're going to do partial psi, partial y. Okay, and so this is going to be four y. Okay, because we're going to take the derivative of two y squared, so that's going to give us four y. Okay, and then v is going to be minus partial psi partial x, okay? and it's going to give us minus 2x, okay? And so those are our velocity components. Okay. Right. And then to get the speed, we sim we're simply just going to take the magnitude of these velocities. And so speed is going to be uh, u squared plus v squared. Okay. So this is speed squared, right? Um, but you know, in order to get get the speed, you just simply just take the square root of this. Okay. And so u squared is going to be um, four y squared. Okay. And so I'm noticing that there's a typo. So this should be sixteen y squared. Okay. Because uh, we take four squared, which is sixteen, and then y squared, which is y squared. And then we take 2x squared, so this would be 4x squared, okay? And so to take the square root, we get u as a function of x and y, and we just get square root of 16y squared plus 4x squared, okay? And so that's how we get the, uh, um, you know, the, um, the components for that, okay, and the speed. And so now that we know the speed, uh, we can solve for the pressures as well, okay? Um, and so to do that, we're gonna use our, um, um, our, Bernou our Bernoulli equation, okay? Okay, and so the second part of the problem tells us that the pressure
at location. Five comma zero is 50 kilopascals. Okay. And so we can use this information in order to find Bernoulli. Okay. And it's because remember, you know, the reason we do this is because when we use Bernoulli, we always have to make a comparison between one point and another point. Okay. And so in order to actually compute the pressure distribution, um, you know, we have to have our reference point. And so this, in this case, is our reference. And so in order to plug it in, let's, uh, let's compute um, the speed at this um, location right here. Okay. And so in order to compute the speed, we just simply have to plug in um, x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 0 uh, into our equation um, on the previous page. And so we do that, we get square root of 16 times zero squared plus um, four times five squared, okay? And then what we get from this after taking the square root is 10 meters per second, okay? Okay, and so now that we, can, we have this, we can set up our Bernoulli equations. We have P naught plus one half rho um, U naught squared plus um, and I'm noticing another typo in here, so there should be rho g y naught, okay? Probably why I got a lot of questions on the homework, okay? And so these, these represent our conditions at 0.50, okay? And so, you know, the typo that I'm referring to is that there should be a density out in front here, you know, by uh, the g, okay? Because otherwise then everything doesn't, is. Uh, everything won't have the same units, okay? Okay, and on the other side, we have um, P1 plus one half rho U1 squared plus rho G Y1, okay? And so this right here is our conditions at any arbitrary point X, Y. Okay. And so everything that we, uh, we have everything that we need on the, on the left-hand side, so let's go ahead and plug in, okay? And so on the left-hand side, what we have is uh, 50 kilopascals, okay? And so 50 kilopascals, we can plug in for P naught, okay? And let's convert it to standard units, so let's convert this down to pascals, okay? Plus one half, uh, density right here, so I guess I didn't give a density, um, but I think we can assume the density is um, 1,000, okay? And so this can be 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed, okay? Multiply by our velocity, so we have um, 10 meters per second squared, okay? And then to this, we're gonna add um, rho g and then times y. And so the y component, or, or the y um, direct, or the y, um, coordinate at the reference point is going to be zero, okay? And so that one's going to be zero. And so we uh, compute all this, and then what we get is um, 100,000. Okay. Right. And so we're going to have 100,000 on that uh, right hand, on that left hand side, okay? And so now that we have everything on this side, um, we can go ahead and plug in for the right hand side, um, and then um, you know solve for P1, okay? Because remember, our goal here is to solve for the pressure distribution at any location, X and Y. And so um, basically, we're gonna plug in for one half rho U1 squared plus rho G Y1, and then that's gonna give us the, uh, um, the expression that we want, okay? Okay, and so bringing that stuff over, we'll have 100,000 is equal to, um, P1, and it's going to be a function of x and y, plus one half rho, and so I'm just going to plug in 500 here because we have we have a density of 1,000, and we divide by two, so we have 500. Okay, and then we also have um, u squared, and so u squared is going to be 16y squared plus 4x squared. Okay, plus 
rho g times y, okay? And so rho is 1,000 times 9.8 times y, okay? And so if we solve this expression for p of x and y, then we simply get p of x and y is equal to 100,000, okay? Minus 500 times 16y squared plus 4x squared, okay? Minus 9,800y, okay? And so this is different than, you know, what I have in the, in the, uh, uh, in the notes because I just noticed just now that there are typos in it, okay? Um, okay, and so that's basically the workflow of what you need to do, um, you know, for these potential flow problems. So, you know, as you add more to your, um, to your stream functions, you know, obviously things can get a lot more complex than this, um, but this is basically the, the general workflow, okay? And so kind of at the end of this notes, what I said is that, you know, if we want to modify the stream function by adding a vortex, And so if we add a vortex, then we simply get psi is equal to x squared plus 2y squared. And so that was our original string function, okay? okay. And then to that, we're gonna add the string function for a vortex. And so the vortex is gonna be um, gamma over two pi ln of Uh, and so that's the uh, that's the stream function for that. And so from here, um, you know, you can basically follow the same process. Um, but you know, first first you take the velocity components, then you find the speed, then you find from the speed you find the pressure. Okay. Uh, but the the difference here is that because we have this r, right? Uh, because we have that r, then it's it's actually going to be more convenient to do this problem in uh, in polar coordinates. Okay. And so in polar coordinates, remember, you're going to make the substitution of r is equal to, uh, x is equal to r cosine theta, and then y is equal to r sine theta, okay? You go ahead and plug those in, okay? And then you're going to find your velocity components in the r direction and the theta direction, okay? Um, but besides that, the, the workflow is, is exactly the same. It's just the algebra, of course, is going to be a lot more uh, complicated just because it's, uh, there's a lot more terms to, to keep in mind, okay? And so for this, it's... Uh, um, you know, it's uh, it's important to kind of stay organized and with your work, especially with all the trigonetonies and the foiling that you need to do. Okay. Uh, okay. And so with that, um, you know, that's that's about an hour. So I, I think you know I'm going to call it here for the review session. So you know, hopefully this was useful for you guys as you uh, as you study for the exam. Uh, but as always, you know, I'm I'm always available for questions. So you can either email me or send me a message on Discord or you know try to contact me in other ways. You know, I'm always happy to answer any questions. Uh, so this exam, you know, it's, 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 you know, we did a lot of stuff, you know, ever since that first exam. So, you know, you, you really want to be uh, efficient with your studying. So, you know, anything, anything that you're stuck on or anything that you're confused about, you know, please reach out. You know, I'm always happy to kind of clear up anything, okay? Uh, and so with that, you know, I'm going to close the review session. So, uh, so thank you, everybody. You know, hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Uh, and best of luck with studying.